Well, good morning, Drummond Island. <laughs> what a great day. Another cloudy day on Drummond Island. <laughs> the leaves are falling. Oh, my. Hey, just want to remind you about Soup Supper uh, this Friday. If you're on the island, 6 o'clock at the Buxton's house. They are the first house on the right on the Kinsey Point Road. So you can kind of wind through there. They're up on the right. Watch for all the cars. Bring a pot of soup. Uh, invite a friend. And it should be a fun time. You can bring a salad or something like that. We're not all legalistic about it. But you better bring some soup. Can we bring you, porridge? You can bring porridge, gruel, whatever you want. A little more, please, sir. So... Um, we got that going. Hey, good job, you guys. The third quarter mission money came in at, this is for local missions, to help families and kids and indiv individuals and organizations out that help promote the love of Jesus in our local area. $3,294.82. Good job, you guys. Wow. Thank you. Yes, the church... Part of it is the church tithes, that means it gives 10% of everything that we, we receive. 10% comes right off the top to go for something outside the church to help people or whatever. And then we add to that, and that's, that's kind of what the Bible calls an offering. So the tithe comes right off the top, and we, that's partly to model um, just healthy stewardship. We talked about that last Sunday. Uh, stewardship of the money and the resources that God gives us, that uh, we give an immediate tithe, or it's like a thank offering, you know, to say thank you uh, to God, and also kind of says, I trust you, you know, to provide for our needs and all of this sort of thing. And he does. God is so good all the time. So third quarter mission money, that's that, and then we'll keep you in touch. We're having a, a uh, leadership meeting this week, and we're going to be discussing, talking about different possibilities for our final quarter. Um, and uh, I don't know, we haven't really collected money for Salvation Army in a long time. They do such a good job up in the Sioux. Um, so that might be a possibility. I don't know. We'll, we'll think about that, right, John? Uh, so what else do we have going? Oh, our first shoebox is in. Yay! 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 So, First shoe box is in, and this feels like a support group. Yay, for the Stacey's. She loves you. <laughs> so please be collecting. It's before the due date. The due date is 2021. It's November 14th, I believe. The second Sunday in November is our official collection date. And then we'll be getting those over to a, another collection point. But uh, that's the final Sunday where we can collect them. And there, there is no grace on that because they go to these big distribution centers and all that stuff. So there's a certain timing and sequence. But anyway, be collecting things. There are brochures, and uh, I think there's still some shoe boxes out. You can use your own shoe boxes. In fact, I believe you can use even little plastic tubs and things. But there is a specific list of do's and don'ts in packing these things because they go all over the world. So, so pack them carefully and prayerfully because these are going to touch the lives of little kids, not only with your love, but with the love of Jesus Christ. And there's little things in there for them about Jesus, too. And they just get so excited. Why well, I've shown the video. So uh, also, if you know of people in the community, because sometimes we get community people who want to do this, but they're not part of a church that sponsors this, but they, they want to reach out to the kids. There are supplies over across the street at the Township Hall. So... Uh, invite people to drop by the Township Hall during their open, their business hours, and you can pick up brochures and, and uh, the shoebox things and all that stuff. So let's get a lot of shoeboxes in this year. Let's help a lot of kids. It should be a really, really cool time. That's, and that's part of our, it's kind of our fourth quarter thing, through Samaritan's Purse. It's a marvelous program. Well, I think that's it. I think without further ado, We've got an exciting kind of topic to talk about today. Um, so, so, so important. But prayer first. 
Thank you, Jesus, for exciting topics. Thank you, Lord, for the harvest of money and resources for local mission. And grant us wisdom, Lord, in helping people and spending that money uh, for your kingdom work. We thank you, Lord, for just the ways that you provide for us. And you're such a good God. Your faithful love that, that rains down on us moment by moment, day and night, 24-7. Thank you, God, for your presence in our lives. Help us to become more aware of all that you are up to. Help us to become more aware of what you're doing in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Open our eyes, Lord, to the flow of your spirit through us, in us, around us, and we give you thanks this morning. We bless your name. In Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. We've got a lively song for you. You can clap your hands. There are flags over here. They're like streamers. You can throw streamers around. You can walk on your hands, jump, dance, whatever. The river is here, God.
And then our final song, which relates to the message this morning. And it's called, He Knows My Name. One of the cool things about being a follower of Jesus is that God has a personal name. We can pronounce the name. Though, we need to do that carefully, but it's an intimate and personal contact with the creator of the universe. And the cool thing is that he knows your name. He knows everything about you. God knows the intricacies of your heart, the little warps and warts and different things that go on in your life, uh, and he loves every part of you. He knows your name, and he loves you every day.
lives of our hearts. People are struggling this morning with all sorts of issues and challenges. And my prayer this morning, Lord, is that you would open our eyes and open our hearts to know that we are absolutely not alone in all of this. That the swirling chaos, as it feels, that you are with us in the storm. Expand our understanding, our consciousness, our view to be able to see you in the midst of the storm. And your hand that is extended to us to help us and lead us and guide us because you know our name, because you love us. In Jesus' name. By the way, one announcement that I forgot, and this is really, really important, is that we're starting something new on Tuesday mornings. We're taking a more directional or structured approach, you might say, rather than just a kind of a discussion that we allow to kind of be a free-for-all. Um, and we get into some deep stuff at times, but it's going to be a little more structured, and we're using, we're going to be using quotes from Richard Rohr's book, uh, the Naked Now, it's got a really sexy title, The Naked Now, <laughs> Seeing as the Mystics See, which is kind of interesting, mysterious, uh, but it's learning, basically, it's learning to see life with new eyes, to understand reality in a whole new way. This is what Jesus talked about as the kingdom of God, to see things and understand and experience life in a whole new way. And so it, this is about working into that together and helping each other to see life in a new way. We're going to be using quotes from this book. Uh, you do not have to do homework. That It's not a book study per se. So we want people to be able to enter into this at whatever level you feel comfortable. So there's not homework. You can come just to class and just participate. We'll read the quote or whatever and the idea. And there are some questions that go along with that. But you can just come in and participate. You can read the quote beforehand. And there are papers out on the, in the foyer that have the quote on it. And each week, each Sunday, we'll have a new paper that will have the quote. And you go, but I'm not here on Sunday, but I want to participate. Wait, there's something for you. You can go to our website. And on the home page, you can click on the link and get the same sheet on the website. Amazing. Computers are great. Yeah, aren't they? So uh, you can do that, and, and you can, or you can read the book if you want to. And I've ordered books for some of the people in the group. Um, and it's on Amazon. It's like $10.68, which is pretty cheap for a book. Um, and it's, again, it's Richard Rohr's book, R-O-H-R. -R. He's a Franciscan priest. And, and it's called The Naked Now. Surely you can remember that. The Naked Now. And that's all you need to know. Put it on Amazon and you can order your own book. Uh, there will be a library copy, though those kind of get snapped up really fast. But uh, there will be a library copy also. But again, you can read the book. You can just do the quote. You can do nothing. You can prepare yourself, think about it, meditate on it, whatever you want to do. But it's going to be a little bit more structured in that sense. Um, there will still be sharing and prayer requests and all of that. But we're looking forward to a, really a, a rich time of exploring what does it mean to live in this world differently, differently than, than people who don't have or aren't working on this kind of new kind of way of looking at life or reality. So I'm excited about this. Uh, we meet in the church library. There's free coffee. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes there's cookies or banana bread and treats. Who knows? But it, it, it should be a rich time. And you're all invited. This is open to the community. Uh, so bring a friend or what have you. And if we get too large, we can move in here because this is comfortable too. But it should be an exciting study. And we'll go deeper. And you can explore spiritual growth in the company of friends. Should be a great time. 
So that's that. Connie wants to take an offering. Connie wants to take an offering. <laughs> Connie is our treasurer. <laughs> and she's gone. Oh. <laughs> yes, could we take an offering? Um, Rod, would you mind passing the plate around? And, and uh, let's see. What's good offering music, Ruth? For... Um, Shake out your money, come on now. Shake out your money. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. No, it's good. I surrender all? I don't know. My library is Oh, okay. All things right and beautiful. All things bright and beautiful. Let's sing a chorus of that. All things bright and beautiful. Texas A&M this morning. They beat Alabama. Woo! Sorry, Nick Saban. Wow. Ooh. Heal my heart, Lord. Help me. It's okay. Michigan won. Michigan State won. Woo! All right. Okay. Enough. So, two weeks ago, Two weeks ago, if you can remember, or you watched on Facebook or what have you, two weeks ago, Kirk preached and he talked about what? The miracle of you. The miracle of you. And it, it was a feel good sermon about how special and how unique all of us are. And, and, and that you're one in a million. And he, and he went through the statistics. It was like one to. Um, 10 billion trillion or something like that, that that the sperm and egg, and I don't know how much detail he went into because it kind of cut off, but I, you know, went together. And, that, and, and it's just, you are a miracle. You are absolutely unique. You know, the, the fingerprints on your hands and, and everything about you, you are a unique individual and you are created with a purpose to live out the love, the truth, the glory of God, and, and to live life as fully as possible, and you radiate that example out to family and friends and, and a world that desperately needs to hear and desperately needs to experience individuals who are growing, who are growing in life, growing in love, growing in God. And so... It's a great, great concept, and, and the problem is, the problem is, is that we just emotionally, I mean, up here we go, yeah, yeah, and all the Bible, scriptures, and how much God loves us, and all of this stuff, we go, yeah, 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 but when we drop down 18 inches to our heart and our emotional life, we fight it, we fight it, and why, why do we fight this? Why do we fight the truth that we are special and unique in the eyes of God? Well, there's a few people who have answered this question. Listen up. Uh, 
but it should be real player. And so, uh, there we go. I can stop shaking. <laughs> so, okay. As you know, we are producing a course called The Power of Self-Compassion. So we're just talking to people today about how they treat themselves. Do you have a critical voice? And if so, what do you find it saying to you? I definitely have a critical voice. Um, I think everybody does. Um, and I think they all start from when you're a kid. So, you know, I think all the things that my parents said, I hear, but it's normally about not doing a good job. It's constantly stopping me as I try to complete thoughts or try to make steps forward. It's a voice that always tells me that I'm not enough or that um, I need to be better or that there's something about me that I have to change. When you fail or make a mistake, what types of things run through your mind? I'm not worthy. Everybody's going to see my mistake. Nobody else makes mistakes like I do. You're stupid. I can't believe you forgot something easy. This was basic. Why are you having so much trouble doing something so simple? People don't want me around that I'm uh, uninteresting, boring, and or just too weird for people's company. It says that I like should have done better. And sometimes it says being worth about myself. Uh, it's probably the loudest thing that's usually coming through my head before anything else is at least bringing that failure over and over. Bringing that failure over and over and over again. And, and that's what our heart is telling us. That's what those voices inside are telling us. That you haven't done a good job. You don't measure up. You probably never will. And the whisper of God says just the opposite to open our eyes, to open our hearts to a whole different kind of reality. Because God's economy, God's economy is so radically different than ours. We're on this performance thing and all of that, and only if we measure up. In fact, most religion, if you study world religions, most religion is performance-based. And, and if you measure up, then, then the deity is happy. If you don't measure up performance-wise, the deity is mad and, and your crops fail or things die or st stuff falls apart. Lightning bolts, whatever. But God, the true God, is not like that. And how do we get it into our minds? How do we get it into our hearts to act differently? And I'd like to take Kirk's thought about the miracle of you, and I'd like to look at that practically. How do we start from where we are, from our place of resistance, our pushing back? Because we all, at some level, even those of us with the best self-esteem, we all push back on the whole idea that we are valued, that we are loved, that we are intrinsically of great value, regardless of of our performance. How do we do that in some practical ways? I'd like to explore that this morning. <coughs> and I'd like to start off with a couple of quotes. I, I ran across a couple of people. One of them, he, he's a 95-year-old Presbyterian minister. Maybe you've read one of his 30 books that he's written. His name is Frederick Bettner. Frederick Bettner. He's a Presbyterian minister, a retired Presbyterian minister. And says this, and this is important because a lot of what we talk about, in fact, really the basis of any spirituality, any following of Jesus, any growing in God, any abundance in our lives comes down to what we would call a consciousness of what's truly going on. In fact, that's what we're going to be studying on Tuesday mornings, to open our minds up to see the bigger picture of what reality is about, because most of us see reality and it's a tiny little slice, a tiny little bit of what reality is about. We think, oh, that's all there is. And God says, oh man, we've got an adventure here. <laughs> and God leads us and opens up that viewpoint larger and larger, and it gets bigger and bigger, and we go, whoa, this is awesome. This must be all there is, oh no. This is a drop in the bucket, you know, in the open. And that's what life becomes, is a continual kind of God taking the blinders off and going, 
Whoa, this is amazing as the Spirit leads us, as the Holy Spirit leads us. So, so Beckner opens up this quote and he says, listen to your life. This is tough to do, okay? This is taking time. Listen to your life. See it for the fathomless mystery that it is. In the boredom and the pain of it, no less than the excitement and gladness. Touch, taste, smell your way to the holy and hidden heart of it. Because in the last analysis, all moments are key moments. And life itself is grace. Ran across another uh, a gal. She's a, a clinical psychologist. And I have to just read the, the little couple sentences where she introduces herself. Never heard of her before, but internet's wonderful. She says, I am Irene Craigle. I work as a clinical psychologist and teach mindfulness, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute, mindfulness on a faith-based university campus. I practice mindfulness because it opens me up to God, a.k.a. brings joy. I am writing here, this is her blog or her website, I'm writing here in hopes of sharing some of my experiences and thoughts related to the practice of mindfulness in the life of a Christian. Thanks for reading. And then she goes on to explain. Mindfulness, it's just like the word mindful, to be aware, mindful of something or somebody. Okay, it's to be aware of something, greater awareness. But it's awareness without the judgments and all of the filters and you know, all the manipulation that we do once we get a thought or we become aware of something. It's to simply allow the thought or whatever is happening to just kind of sink in a, a, more of an openness to that and to let God kind of work with that rather than us manipulating. Anyway, mindfulness is rooted in self-compassion. Without self-compassion, moment-to-moment awareness can become excruciating. Life is hard, and we often work fairly hard to avoid that awareness. This allows a lurking belief that life is hard because we are doing something wrong. That is our fault. That other people are doing it better, and we just can't get our act together. We see others' marriages, parenting, financial status, professional accomplishments, friendships, cars, etc., and think, what is wrong with me that I can't live the way I want to? Through self-compassion, we change this response to ourselves and notice that life isn't hard because we're doing something wrong. Life is hard for everyone. We start to receive God's grace and treat ourselves like a friend when we're hurting rather than beating up on ourselves because we're suffering. We stop comparing and experience gratitude for whatever abundance in whatever form we have. Gratitude. So my, sometimes you'll hear mindfulness or um, contemplative prayer, well, and we're going to be exploring this on Tuesday morning, that contemplation is similar to that, where you contemplate something, but again, without the filters or judgments and things like that, you simply allow the Holy Spirit to work on you, to mold you, to move you, to do some things, and you try to bring your resistance down as much as possible. Now, none of us can bring it down to zero, and God understands that. So God works in the midst of our resistance and joyfully leads us along, kicking and screaming or whatever we are. But, but if we want to do this, if we want to have the bigger view, and we're talking about a self-compassionate view, a view of ourselves, then God will bring us there. Even when we're kicking and screaming, even with all of our post-traumatic stress stuff going on from childhood or whatever kind of parents you had or whatever kinds of voices that you hear or even presently whatever kinds of negative stuff is going on for you right now and all your self-judgment God will lead you out of this I will say it again because God is faithful God will lead you out of this you can cooperate with this 
and it can be an adventure, or you can go kicking and screaming and it can feel like hell. But God's still going to lead you out of that because that's what God does. God is faithful. In fact, I ran across a wonderful scripture in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, and I want to read that to you this morning. And it's a chapter, a lot of the middle parts of Isaiah, I mean, it's a great book, 66 chapters, um, kind of the mid part of Isaiah, a lot of it is about, and this is typical of the prophets, it's railing on the Jewish people for, for trying to do their own thing. For trying to devise their own way, for living on a whole performance standard that they've set for themselves rather than God. And they're just off on their own, doing their own thing, and things are falling apart. What a surprise. And so this particular chapter in chapter 30, he's talking about how they're trusting in Egypt and, and making alliances and doing things. And it's all politically correct, but it has nothing to do with God. Nothing to do with God's kingdom or the purposes that he has for them. And they're way off track. And so he comes down and he's absolutely truthful. However, and this is so important, he says in verse 15, chapter 30, verse 15, For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and in rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. I have that hanging in my office as a reminder to me. Repentance. Remember, repentance is a switching, switching of your mindset. That's what the Bible, biblical version means. It means literally to turn from one mindset and one pathway, one reality. You know what? You've got it all figured out. All this. Repentance is that radical shift over to a whole new mindset. And you go, whoa, that's tough. I'm an old person. I can't think in new ways. Yes, you can. <laughs> and God, God can shift us no matter what age we are or background or whatever. We can enter into that shift that God is doing. Repentance and rest. Learning to rest. You could put trust next to that. You will be saved. And mostly saved from yourself. And then a few verses on, in, then verse 18 is the one I want to take a look at. Because I love the Bible because it, predict, it gives us these paradoxes. And Jesus, of course, is the chief paradox of all. You know, fully human, fully God, um, and goes to the cross. And the cross is a, its own paradox, you know, where it seemingly opposites are reconciled. Crazy stuff happens. And I love the Bible for that, that it includes that. It's not just an easy instruction book. You get to wrestle with it. Well, wrestle with this one. This is verse 18. Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Try to catch this, the, the spirit of this, the passion of this. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. And therefore, he waits on high, waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of what? Justice. I know. I'm expecting love, mercy, tender-heartedness, something like For God is a God of justice. And all of a sudden, my sense of justice, the idea of justice, is totally redefined. Because justice is based upon God's grace and God's compassion. Whoa! And I, I can't even begin to... I mean, I'm still trying to figure, how does that go together? Justice, and, and it's based on compassion? Really? And grace? How blessed are all those who long for him. Not necessarily it's lost, or theology, theology, or whatever. Long for him. Blessed are those. And the word blessed is happy, fulfilled, are those who long for him. Because he longs for you. And that's the, his scheme of justice. That's how he's working things out in this crazy world. Is he's moving all of history towards a just place. But it's based on compassion. It's based on a love, an overflowing love. And we see that most amazingly in the cross of Christ. The ultimate sacrifice. 
where God no longer requires, he doesn't, the whole concept of God is that we come and we do our performance thing and we, we give a billy goat or money or whatever. We sacrifice something to God to appease God. No, God switches that totally around and he says, I become the sacrifice. I become the sacrifice. And you, you go, well, what's left for me to do? How about trust it? Or as Jesus says, believe the good news. How about trusting that, that God offers? He offers himself to us as the sacrifice. He loves us. He connects with us. He moves us. He shifts us. He wants, he longs to be gracious to us. And we go, oh, and we do the number. We do the performance number. And we say, eh, maybe another day. And God waits. He longs for us. Beautiful story of that is in Luke chapter 15. The prodigal son, you know, where the, the kid goes, I want my inheritance and I want my money and, and give it to me now. And, and J.G. Wentworth. And, and he goes off to, you know, squander his money and women and drugs and all sorts of stuff, whatever they had in those days. And he goes off and he has a great time, but then he spends all his money and he's feeding pigs and he's slopping around with the pigs. And then he goes, this is no life. I'm going to try to get, go back to dad's farm and beg for mercy because I have screwed up majorly. And it's like he, he epitomizes all of our performance orientation. Well, there's the other brother too. He helps epitomize that. But, but he epitomizes all this performance orientation. I don't deserve to be called your son anymore. Maybe I, I could be a slave. Maybe I could be a slave. And dad is waiting for him, just like God waits to have compassion on us. He's waiting for him. He's looking on the horizon every day. Dad doesn't go after him. He doesn't try to talk him into, come on, you know, come on home. He doesn't send him texts or emails or, you know, selfies. Hey, I'm here for you and all this. Because the kid knows in his heart. Well, he knows a little bit in his heart. Enough to go home. And the kid's not even into town. There's a whole story with that. But anyway, dad comes and he runs. He lifts up his, his robes and he's running, you know, and, and just embraces the son. And the son tries to get his performance thing out. And he's cut short from dad and puts the ring on his finger and kills the fatted calf and has a party and all of this. And the kid isn't able to finish his statement because the overwhelming love of this father for this kid just spills out all over the place, just gushes out all over the place. And we think to ourselves, how sloppy. Where's that sense of justice? That kid needs to get what he deserves. Well, guess what? God's justice doesn't work that way. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> And so, and so it's understanding some basic things about God. But we've got to go farther. We've got to, in order to begin to practice some of this stuff, we've got to go farther. One last thing, too, about this is important because God wants you to live the life that he envisions for you. It's a full life. It's a life full of peace and joy and all of this stuff. It's a life where you never feel alone, where you, where you are, are, are on a pathway, a journey of learning with, with a good friend who will never leave you or forsake you. But it's not just about you. It's about other people. It's about transforming his creation. Because everything that you do, what you project out, changes things. Whether you think so or not, no matter what your opinion of yourself, you, you change things, what you send out. And what you send out is what you believe about yourself. If you feel yourself to be of low value, that's your vision of life. Sorry, it just works that way. In fact, Jesus, probably one of the most profound psychological statements in the whole Bible or ever, is when Jesus is asked, he says, well, what must I do 
to live fully, to live a full life, or to be saved, or I forget. But, and, and Jesus says, well, love God with everything that you have, and then what does he say? Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's not just an invitation. It's, it's an indication of what is truly true. Because that's what we do. We love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And this is not about being self-indulgent and about, whoa, I'm the center of the universe and all of that. No, this is loving yourself in the light of God's revelation for you. This is loving yourself with a true love, a healthy love. And being able to think about that and contemplate that and be mindful about that. Loving yourself with a true love. Even in the midst of our pushback. And that God even looks at our pushback and says, that's okay. We can work together. And you go, well, I'm not even sure I believe in you. It's okay. We'll work with that. Well, I'm not even sure I want to do this, all this stuff. I'm not religious and all that. We come up with all sorts of stuff. God goes, fine. Well, we can work with that. And God receives us where we are. In all of our grumpiness or irreligion or whatever we're at. We, and God just says, we can work with that. Let's move forward. And God goes, let's take a step. I don't feel like taking a step. Let's take a baby step. I don't feel like taking a baby step. Well, let's just kind of, shh, just kind of shuffle a little bit forward. I can do that. And you shuffle inch by inch. And God says, I can work with that. And so, it's loving your neighbor as yourself. There's, oh, there's a, a portion in Matthew 20, where, where Jesus is trying to work with people. And when you look at the, all the stories about Jesus in the Gospels, the theme is, is he's trying to present a whole new way to look at life. And there's pushback, and, and especially from the disciples, too. I mean, his own close followers, right? And, and, well, let's take a look at Matthew 20. There's two blind guys. Matthew 20, verses 29 and 34. And it's at the end of the chapter, and it says, As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Okay, lots of people. And two blind men sitting by the road, because that's all they could do, right? They've got their little ponchos on, and they sit by the road, and that's their home. They don't have homes, they don't have places to go. They sit with these ponchos, you know, the hole in the top, and that becomes their tent. That's their home, and it rains on them, and maybe occasionally snows and whatever. That's their home. They don't have any place to go. They don't have any friends. There's no social care network to take care of them. They sit by the road. And they know that they're all alone. Nobody's going to help them except a few occasional coins that come their way. So they're sitting by the road, two blind men, and Jesus was passing by. They heard that Jesus was passing by. And they have the guts to cry out even knowing that there's going to be murmurs and whispers against them. Because they, they certainly don't go into town. They don't, they're not part of society. They're outcasts. They're on the edge of this, any social group. But they cry out anyway. They take a risk. And they cry out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And the crowd tells them to shut up. You're making noise. And they cry out all the more, and they're persistent. Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And they're just, and the crowd's going, you're so obnoxious. Why don't you just be quiet and be good blind people? And, uh, and Jesus stops. And he calls them. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? This is God saying, what do you want me to do for you? This is not the God who commands you and do this or you're going to go to hell or whatever it is or being hard and all this. This is Jesus. This is God. 
This is the second person of the Trinity saying, what do you want me to do for you? This is where this mindfulness thing comes in. You know, that oftentimes we don't even know what's wrong with us. And this is part of trying to practice self-compassion is, first of all, making a commitment to listen, like Beckner said, Frederick Beckner said, listen to yourself, listen to your life. And we don't take time to listen, to carve out time in the morning, in the evening, at, at noonday, whatever time is open or semi-free of distraction, and just listen to your life. What the heck is going on? Get off the conveyor belt and do some mindful thoughtfulness uh, to think about, say, God, what's going on? Ask the question. Why am I so upset? Why are, why are things bugging me so much? Why am I so negative? Why am I so depressed? Why, why is all this stuff happening? But ask the question and give God a time to answer. What is going on? And be open as much as possible to a crazy, wild answer through the Holy Spirit. And listen to it. What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. And maybe that was followed by a, duh, <laughs> we're blind. <coughs> But God got them to think about what they needed. What did they need? They listened to their lives. We want our eyes to be open. And moved with compassion. And it's not pity. It's not just awe. I feel sorry for you, poor things. The Greek word here is splankna. Remember? Splankna. It refers to the deep guts of stuff. Jesus felt this deep inside his body and soul and being. Splankna. Deep. The bowels. I think King James says bowels of mercy. Which is probably the closest translation to the Greek. Bowels of mercy. And Jesus felt it deep. And God feels it deeply. When we cry out, we think nobody hears. And God feels it deeply inside. Moved with compassion, he feels it. Jesus touched their eyes. And immediately, they regained their sight and followed him. So often we're like the world. The crowd that just says, quiet. Be quiet. Suffer in silence. Suffer by yourself. Don't bother me. Don't rock my boat. I'm just trying to make it in life. And all this suffering going on. And God's very, very different. He not only hears our cries, but he's moved with deep compassion for the things that you are experiencing. And particularly your response to that and how you judge yourself. How you judge yourself. And you do this all on a whole performance level. And sometimes religion isn't all that much better. Churches and, and religion, all that stuff. You know, we talk about grace, but, but we're still in that performance thing. More than we realize. And performance is, it has its place. But we elevate it, we worship it, and we let it drive who we are. And God says, please, I wait to have compassion on you. It's so hard. <laughs> I know I'm God, but it's hard. You know, give me a break. And for us to begin, to begin to listen to what's going on inside, that's number one. Just be willing to take the time when we're up against stuff, and, and especially you know, when we're judging ourselves or being, beating ourselves up or shaming ourselves or whatever, to please, to listen to that 
and then allow God to shower us. Even if we don't feel it at the time, even if it's, you know, we're resistant and all that, to just listen to it. And then have friends around, and this is the other thing, is to have friends around, encouraging voices. Friends who will have compassion on you. This is where we need to change some of our attitudes because we look at people who are struggling with things, no matter what it is in their life, whether it's physical or whatever, and to, to begin to have those bowels of mercy, to have that compassion for one another as we're going through stuff. And it still means encouraging us, encouraging people to go on better paths, but it doesn't involve all the judgment and all that stuff. It involves those bowels, that deep compassion inside to encourage people because it's life and death. It's life and death. And to become friends, to gather around people rather than avoid them or tell them to shut up because that's what the world does. And even Jesus' own disciples do that. They did it with the kids and they do it with all the voices that seem annoying to them. But those are God's people. Those are God's people. And he longs to have compassion and to heal them. And so learning to listen to our, the, the things inside of us and letting God be part of that, even if it's only a spoken prayer and our emotions are like all over the place, but we speak the prayer, God, what's going on? God, be with me. Jesus, walk with me. And he goes, I am. This is so important. And the idea is to begin to practice self-compassion in little ways, little bits at a time. Because as you do this, and, and neuroscientists have proven this, you know, that the more we practice something, the deeper the the neuron pathways go and, and our brains begin to fire in those ways. Little by little, tiny bit by tiny bit. You don't have to have these big conversions. You can just do little by little and just say, God, whenever, I mean, give God a challenge. Whenever I am judging myself or shaming myself, I give you permission to help me with this. Make me aware, number one, beep, red flag goes up or whatever inside. And then help me, work with me, teach me, instead of just reacting to stuff and shaming myself and coming down myself. I give you permission. I mean, this is important. God waits to have compassion on you. He won't barge in. So give him permission and just say the prayer. Say it out loud. Take a walk in the forest. God, I give you permission to, to help me understand when I'm hurting myself verbally or mentally or whatever. And then work with me, even if it's momentary. Give God permission in little places. And you'll find that your habit patterns will begin to be disrupted. Little by little. Watch for it. It may take years. Give God permission. But God will whittle away at your old view of reality. Bit by bit, piece by piece, and begin to build a new reality that looks a lot like Jesus. Little by little, have friends around you. Be willing to look at your life. Be mindful about what's really going on. And then make a commitment to letting God be part, whittling away at the old reality and building something new and exciting because the world needs you to do that right now in this day and age. The world needs to see transformed people. Please. So, relax in your seat. Fine. Probably all tense now. <laughs> oh man, that's heavy stuff. 
<laughs> this is, uh, can you tell a joke or something? You know, just relax in your seat. I'm going to lead you in a little three-part exercise. Cleansing breath. <laughs> You're on your fourth cup of coffee or whatever. And, but just relax in your seat. It's not like psychology group or something like that, but just, just work with me on this. just want to close with a little exercise. Okay, I'd like you to imagine a stressful situation. Just relax. No. <laughs> no, I'd like you to imagine something that you're struggling with, particularly something where you're, you do, you're doing that judgment thing on yourself. Just like those people said about... Oh, you know, I'm never enough and just keep cycling in my head. You know, you're not doing it right. It's so simple. Why can't you do this? You know, and those kinds of judgment things. Imagine something that you're working with right now. Okay. Maybe it's a person that you're struggling with or a financial thing or government or whatever it is. Something that's got you tense and that you're trying to fix and you're not real successful at it. And the voices are kind of judging that. I guess it's from the inside. It's not like this, it's like this. Okay, imagine a stressful situation. Okay, you got, is everybody sufficiently tense? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so number two. I'd like you to just listen to what's going on in your body right now. Do you have, what happens when you get tense? Feel it in your stomach, your brow, things, muscles tense up. How about your heart? A little sweaty? I am. <laughs> uh, what's happening? Or what's happening emotionally for you? Are you connecting this with some other memories? Are things like dots being connected? Are you having emotional flashbacks or, you know, different kinds of things. What's going on for you? Hmm. And then, having gotten that little taste of that, the final thing is speak to your anxious heart. Speak to those voices that are coming out of your heart. Speak to your heart as you would a good friend. Speak to your heart with messages that you would give to a really good friend. Because the messages that you give to yourself that are negative, and shaming is usually never the way that you would talk to a good friend. And when you speak those messages as you would to a good friend, you begin to align with the very words that Jesus himself is saying to your heart. This is how Jesus talks to you. He talks to you with a voice that is so glad that you're including him in the struggles that you're going with, in the struggles with yourself, and the things that are going on. And we say, I'm not worthy, just like the prodigal son. I could be a slave, maybe, at best. And Jesus, just with tears in his eyes, he said, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. Bit by bit, there are no shortcuts in transformation. There are no shortcuts in being molded by the loving hands of Jesus. Bit by bit, please, Practice transformation. Practice self-compassion. Because you cannot give away what you don't have already. Amen.
So, you are a miracle. And you guys on Facebook and YouTube, you guys are miracles too. So thank you so much for watching and pass this along. I mean, share this. If, if this had a bit or a kernel of any truth or encouragement for you, share it or subscribe to Facebook. Um, it'll also be uploaded to YouTube. Um, and just, we thank you for your support and all of that. Uh, stay tuned to the homepage of uh, Lighthouse Church, uh, www.lighthousechurchdrummanisland.com. And there's going to be new stuff each week, especially for Tuesday morning. But just keeps you abreast of news and stuff going on. But thank you for your support. And share this stuff. Let's be transformed people to transform this planet in a time of desperate need for love and truth in sharing Jesus. God bless you.